Good morning, church. Good morning. It is so good to be with all of you this morning. Oh, there we go. Mic's on. <laughs> good morning, church. It's so good to be with each and every one of you and all of you who are online. We appreciate and love each and every one of you. This morning, as we come together, we have a reading from Exodus chapter 20, uh, verses 1 through 17. And this is a very common passage. Most of us know it or hear it, or maybe we think we know it a little bit better than we do. It's the Ten Commandments. So I invite you to join along as I read this. Then God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above or is on the earth beneath or that is in the water or under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord, your God, am the jealous God, punishing children for the inequities of parents to the third and fourth generation of those who reject me, but showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses God's name. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work. You, your son, your daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock, or the alien resident in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, but rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it. Honor your father and mother, so that the days you may, may be long in the land the Lord is giving you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife or male or female slave or ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Lord, Father God, we come before you today. Thankful for your word. Thank you for the opportunity to just have this breath in our lungs this moment. God, we ask that as we turn to your scripture, as I preach this sermon, God, that the words I have are not just my own ramblings or thoughts, but things that you, Holy Spirit, have for each and every one of us, including myself, to hear and grow and know. God, reveal your heart to us today. Help us to see who you are and who we are in you and who you are calling us to be. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The Ten Commandments. This very popular list of laws, these things that so many nations and laws have been built upon. We claim to, to know them, to see them, to appreciate them. And often if we're asked, Maybe some of us who were really good at Sunday school would be able to name all ten without any help. But often, if you're like me, you start counting and you realize you're missing one or two somewhere. But we know that these are important commandments. But yet, we don't fully understand the whole picture sometimes of why they exist or how they came to be. Today, I want to talk about the Ten Commandments as a glimpse into the heart of God. But to do that, we have to start with some context. Why did the Ten Commandments come about in the first place? Why do they exist? What was God trying to do? You see, God's desire, first and foremost, is relationship with God's people, with you and with me. Right? In Genesis 19, mean, not Genesis 19, in Exodus 19, we read this story of how God says he bore the people on eagles' wings. This beautiful image of God carrying God's people when they could not carry themselves. It is the Lord, our God, the Lord, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. The whole section of scripture for the Ten Commandments starts with this phrase, this very important phrase. I am the Lord, your God. I did this for you. I brought you out of the land of Egypt. God does not just give Ten Commandments, Ten Rules to follow. God starts with an affirmation of who God is to you. 
I'm the God who loves you. I'm the God who met you in the house of slavery. I am the God who bore you on eagles' wings and brought you out. In Exodus 19, you see God talking to the people. He says, you have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession out of all the peoples. Indeed, the whole earth is mine, but you shall be for me a priestly kingdom and a holy nation. God's desire for the people is that they would be his treasured possession. And as we read in Genesis, it's not just because God loves these Israelites so much, he thinks they're better than everyone else. No, actually, God says, I am blessing you so that all of the families, all of the nations will be blessed through you. You are blessed to be a blessing. That is what God calls the people in Israel to do, and that is what God calls us to do people of God to be today. God calls them to be a holy, a set apart people. He wants them to look different from the people who are around them. God wants them to be the example of who God is so that as people interact with God's people, they start to see a slight glimpse of who God is. Is this not why God says that we are created in God's image? That you and I bear God's image to the world. This beautiful depth of relationship that God has for us. That we as the people of God, and specifically as we look back in time at the people of Israel, are called to be this image-bearing group of people. Set to reveal something that people hadn't seen yet. To start to see who this God is what this God is doing. You see, in Genesis and in Exodus, we don't really have a full flesh out yet of who this God is. God hasn't named God's self. He he hasn't told these people, right? Moses starts to see it. He's trying to reveal it. But the people of Israel, all they know is that this God supposedly made a promise and a covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But for 400 years, they have been slaves in Egypt. It's probably pretty hard to believe that this is a God who has a promise and a covenant for you and your family when all of your ancestors only know is slavery. But yet this is the God who meets the people. This is the God who brings them out of Egypt. He gives them a story and reminds them of who God is and says, I love you so much. I am rescuing you so that you will be my people. But here's the problem. It's been 400 years in captivity. How are these people supposed to live? They don't even know. How do they structure themselves? How do they have leadership? How do they know what to do? They're following Moses, and yet, if you read the story of Exodus, Moses has a lot of his own issues. The people of God don't know where to go or how to be a holy, set-apart people. So what God does is he calls Moses up the mountain. He communes with Moses one-on-one, and he has a conversation, and out of this conversation, Moses comes down the mountain bearing these stone tablets with these Ten Commandments. Now, we need to remember, the Old Testament is actually full of 613 commandments. There's a lot of commands that the people of Israel are supposed to follow, but these ten, these Ten Commandments, they take this center stage. For most of us, and even in our own government there, seated in our Supreme Court, we we phrase them and use them in our own legislature. But these Ten Commandments kind of map out the very essence or the heart or the foundation of God's law for the people. So God steps in. He gives the law to the people. And as we look at these commands, we notice that they can kind of be broken down into these two categories. The first category is us and God. The first three commandments, if you break them down, you shall have no other God before me. Do not make or worship idols. Do not use God's name in vain. The fourth, keep the Sabbath as a holy day for God. The second category is us and one another. You see, honor your parents. 
Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not covet. And if you've noticed on this list, one of those takes the place of both categories. The Sabbath. It is about us and God and us and one another. And actually, in, in my belief, it holds a very important framework for how we understand what God is trying to do. But before we get there, let's talk about us and God. Right? Often when we talk, especially in secular places or out in the world, people talk about the Ten Commandments and they look at this right side. Okay, honor your parents. Depends on how, how nice your parents were to most people. Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not be jealous or covet or want to take things from your neighbors. Everyone's like, yeah, those are great things. We should do that. But when we go to the other side, us and God, that's where people start to say, oh, you know, we don't have to follow these ones. That's religiousness. That's whatever. But as we look at this story and how God is relating to God's people, we begin to see why all of these are so deeply important. Have no other God before me. We're talking about a group of people who are coming out of Egypt where they served multiple gods. Where the main areas around them served different gods and different rules. And if you even think back to the stories in Genesis, Abraham was told to go and sacrifice Isaac and didn't bat an eye. And if we look at the culture around them, child sacrifice was a commonality to appease gods. You see, when God says, have no other gods before me, he's not just saying, only worship me because I just want all of your attention. He's saying, these other things, these other gods, these other rules you follow, they do not lead to your life. I want you to have no other God before me because I am the God who bores you on eagles' wings. I am the God who loves you and your people. I am the God who is bringing you to something beautiful and fruitful. Not a God who takes from you without reason. Not a God who has you appease me because I am so angry with you, but a God who loves you so much that we as Christians know, I would sacrifice my very self for you. God says, have no other gods before me because God does not want us to step into things that do not lead us to life. Do not make or worship idols. Right? Do not put your attention towards things that have no value. Do not give yourself over to something that does not love and guide you the way that I love and guide you. And if we're honest with ourselves, most of us, although we don't see them as items of worship, probably have some idols that take a lot of our attention still today, do we not? There's an interesting article talking about if in a thousand or two thousand years, there was no history of our time period, and yet people started excavating and finding old ruins. They would assume that we worshiped these boxes in the center of our screens where we would come and there had all these seatings and areas and everything was focused on this one square tablet in the middle of the room. When we look at our lives, there are tons of things that we give our attention and our care to, whether they're celebrities or sports teams or our phones. God says do not make or worship idols because God knows that serving and putting yourself into these things leads us to nothing but heartache and sorrow and meaninglessness. God's desire is for the people to follow God, to see that there is a life abundance to be lived. A life that is offering you purpose. Setting you apart from others so that every day you may taste and see that God is good. And then the third verse, do not use the Lord's name in vain. And often in our own world, and probably rightfully so, we say that means, you know, don't say things like G. Dane, you know. We say don't, don't just go around saying Jesus Christ for no reason. But when we look at this verse, there's actually far more to it than just that. When you invoke the name of God, you are using the very essence of the power structure that those people know. You go to them and say, God has told me that you need to sell your stuff and give me half the money. <laughs> or if you just give 10% of this money to this and buy this oil, then you will have everything you need. Do not use the Lord's name in vain means do not use the Lord's name without God's permission. Do not speak on behalf of me for other people, 
Let me speak to them myself. Do, we, do not use the Lord's name in vain. Means do not use the power that I have in people's hearts against them for their room. But instead allow me, God, to be I am, Yahweh. I am who I am. You can see how these three laws were incredibly important if the people of Israel were going to survive as a people. But they are still important for us. If we look at the essence and the root and the reason why God gives these laws. God loves you. Follow God fully. Don't give yourself over to things that have no purpose or meaning or lead you to ruin. Do not worship things that are not worth your time and energy. Follow God because God has a purpose and a plan and a love that is all-consuming. Do not try to use God's name to seek your own pain or your own power or to hurt others because this is not a God who oppresses, but a God who frees. When we look at the list on the right side, we kind of know why those are important. If you're going to live together, you probably shouldn't kill each other. If you're going to live together, you shouldn't be committing adultery and doing these things and breaking people's hearts almost as painful as death itself behind their backs. Do not bear false witness to one another because God wants you to trust and build community together. But if you are lying and bearing falsities against one another, no one can trust. You see, us and one another is incredibly important because for God, as we read in the New Testament, where two or more are gathered, there I am with them. Community, trust. It is the core of a community and it is the core of what God wants for us in life. That we would have friendships and partnerships and churches where we can come together and love and care for one another. And then there's this one in the middle, the both that I put in here. Keep the Sabbath. And as we look at this story of the Sabbath, we start to see something really important. Because if we're honest and we took a poll here and endlessly, we'd probably say that of all of these Ten Commandments, the Sabbath is the one that we tend to do the worst. And I am not one to really preach on this, as I am, of course, working a full-time job with college students and also preaching here with Paige. But the Sabbath is this incredibly important element of God's life for us. It is an important centerpiece in the Ten Commandments because in the Sabbath we see this combining of things. You are to rest on the seventh day, set it wholly apart for God, to worship God, to have time in nature, to see God's goodness, to dwell on all that's doing. But also, as we read this scripture and we read that verse, we see it's that no one is to do any work. Your sons or your daughters, the male or female slaves, the servants, the workers. This day is not just about us with God, but it's about making sure that people who are not in positions of power are not being abused by those who are. In God's kingdom, it doesn't matter if you're a boss or an employee, you have rest. In God's kingdom, those people who don't have the right to speak for themselves get defended by God's law. God says, we need to take this day. We need rest. As people, we are not defined by our productivity, but instead we are defined by our relationship with God. That we are God's people, God's son or God's daughter, God's holy nation. If we're honest with ourselves, we see that this is so hard to do because our culture is so anti-rest. We want to be doing more, seeing more. We don't want to miss out on what life has for us. The young people will say, we, don't, we have this fear of missing out, this FOMO. But the reality is that in our need for productivity and our need to do more, to earn more money, to, to save up, to do the things we need to do, we miss out on all of the days of life that God has for us. And not only that, but we damage two of the most important relationships. Right? We don't damage our relationship with God because God's love is all-consuming and is always pursuing and always is there. But we hurt our relationships with our families and our friends and we don't have time for them. And we hurt our relationships with ourselves. 
We need rest. We need to know that we are not defined by our successes or our productivity, but defined by the God who calls us his very own. We are created in God's image. We are saved and redeemed by grace through Jesus' body and blood. God has told you how much you are worth, and the cost and value is infinite. You see, as we look at the Ten Commandments, it doesn't just give us these rules to follow. It didn't just give the people of Israel these rules to follow so they could survive until Jesus came, but it gave them and it gives us a glimpse of God's very heart. Out of God's deep desire for relationship with us, we see God's heart in this law. God desires our good. God desires deep and loving relationships with us and for us. God wants you to have a deep, deep relationship with God in your quiet times and in your movings about. But God wants you to have deep relationships with the people to your left and to your right, to the people in your homes, in your offices, on the streets. God's law is not just about following God and making God happy. God's law is about providing life. For us. And God's law is about us having a love and a life for ourselves and this world. See, the Sabbath holds it all together. Take time to worship and remember who God is. That God loves you, that God is for you, that God is truly the only thing worth your worship and time. But take time to be with those that you care about, to be with your community to be with the people who work for you, the people you work for, your family, your loved ones, your friends, your neighbors, and take time for yourself. It's often said, one of the two greatest commandments is to love your neighbor as yourself, which means you need to learn how to love yourself well. Because how can you love your neighbor as yourself if you are not taking care and loving yourself first? God's law holds all of these things in tension because this is God's heart, that we would love God with all our heart, soul, strength, and mind and love our neighbor as ourselves and taking care of the world and the people in it. This is why Jesus says in Matthew 5, I have not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. That through Jesus' offering of himself, his body and blood in which we celebrate today in communion. We have been set free not to dismiss the law, but to experience the fullness of God's heart and love for us so that we may share it with the world. This is the core of the Ten Commandments, that there is a God who loves you, who bears you on eagles' wings. He tells you not to fall off the path, not for God's benefit, but for your own. To see that God's way of life is the one that leads the way, the truth, and to the life. And that through caring for one another and caring for yourself, you experience the fullness of the kingdom of God that is here now and yet to come. This Lent, I pray that we take time to search God's heart to look at our idols, to look at the things that we are doing that are not leading to life, to take time to Sabbath. So often we give up things in Lent, but yet we don't do the things that are the very bare necessities of Christianity or life. Take time to rest. Take time to love those who are around you better and deeper and to see what God will do with that. Would you pray with me? Heavenly God, Lord, we thank you for this day. God, we thank you for the hearts that you offer us through your law. That God, although we so often see these things and repeat them and say them and we know that they're good, we often forget to look at the bigger story. That you are a God who meets us where we are, a God who sacrifices your only son for us and for the world. A God who loves us so much that you offer yourself to us each and every day. 
Continue to reveal your heart to us, Lord. And help us to be people who have the courage and the wisdom to seek you fully at all times. Continue to warm and grow our hearts towards you, towards one another, and towards ourselves. We love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.